to criticize the story of a people trying to free themselves from their own bleak history. people who have a heritage of persecution, the Armenians hoard painful memories and embellish them with sentimental effects. This is to convince the world that they have suffered enough, that they need support in the struggle to survive. They've even built a monument to suffering on the highest point of land in Yerevan, the capital of Armenia. It's a permanent reminder of their claim that their enemies once tried to exterminate them and failed. History has been unkind to the Armenian people, and in their remembering, they're hard on themselves. All the time, something happened with me. All, all the time, something happened. And if you saw Armenian eyes, there is all the time, like, very sad eyes. Child is born, and her eyes is sad, sad. High in the Caucasus Mountains in the Soviet Republic of Armenia, there's a struggle underway in the aftermath of the latest episode in the saga of Armenian pain. The new cemetery in Spitak is silent now, except for the sound of grieving. For weeks, it was noisy with the sounds of digging and burying. There are 3,000 fresh graves for the victims of the earthquake that devastated the city December 7th. On a still Sunday evening, the living seek refuge among the dead. When everything has been taken away, grief is an escape from the overwhelming challenge of surviving. A young factory worker spends Sunday alone. His entire family is buried here. But who can say that the cemetery is a sadder place than the ruins of Spitak? When he's in the company of the living, there's idleness and uncertainty, a degrading daily lineup to wait for back wages, for answers to questions about severance pay, for endless and pointless speculation about compensation for losses which are incalculable. Each day they wait for news about the livelihood that ended abruptly near noon, December 7th, when their factory, like their town, collapsed around them. There's nothing to do but wait for a decision on the future of their factory. There's nothing more they can do for their city. The survivors have been rescued. The dead have been recovered. The town cannot be repaired. Spitak will be leveled and rebuilt somewhere else, perhaps on safer ground. Spitak was near the epicenter of the earthquake. There were 25,000 people living here. Half the survivors have since fled. In a way, the worst part of the tragedy is now beginning, as the numbness wears off and the hurting begins. A tour of the destruction reveals a common frustration, and it's quickly discharged at a local communist leader. These women tell them they're trying to salvage their shattered families, but that the help they're getting from the authorities is inadequate. Faizid Baboyan is overwhelmed by the grief of a son who lost his wife and four of his ten children. She's afraid he's going crazy. He can only weep and wander the streets all day. In Armenia, 25,000 died, 500,000 are homeless. That's your house. Probably the frustration is more a reflection of the scale of the tragedy than the effectiveness of the response. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Baboyan and her son live in this tent with four other family members. Her daughter-in-law, she says, was a Soviet hero mother because of the number of children she had. But all the children are gone now. 
four dead, the rest in a makeshift orphanage a hundred kilometers away. The emergency hospital still handles a trickle of patients with mostly minor injuries. It's largely deserted now, but the calm is misleading. Only a lull while medical personnel monitor for signs of epidemic from the lack of shelter and sanitation. And they wait for the crisis they fear most, a mass psychological breakdown. Dr. Ashad Devtian told us the next round of problems will be even more challenging than the first. At the beginning, we had to face the physical trauma. It was the physical ailments that came first. As these injuries become healed, we will then begin to see more of the other, more complex kinds of illnesses, the psychological problems, which naturally follow the initial damage. Several times a week, Mrs. Baboyan sends her son Yuri off to visit his six surviving children. The cabbage will supplement the food they get in an overcrowded shelter for child refugees. Thousands of Armenian children have been moved from the earthquake zone to safer places. The rupture between adults and children is perhaps the most painful result of the upheaval that wrecked four cities and 58 villages here last December. Everywhere you look, there are signs of interrupted childhood, moments of terror captured and held like photographs. The tragedy is constantly renewed. Every time an adult looks at a child, it's a reminder of lost children. Every time a child looks at an adult, it's a reminder of a lost parent or grandparent. There were 3,500 children in school here December 7th. Today, there are fewer than 500. 1,800 have gone away. 1,200 are dead. Hamlet Kazarian is director of this new school. He lost his wife and a son in the earthquake. Will the children return to Spitek? Yes, of course, of course. There will be no other decision. I will never live here, and the children feel the same way. We will live in Spitak and rebuild our city. It is difficult, but my colleagues and myself believe that we will overcome. <laughs> Yuri Babayan's six surviving children range in age between 18 and four. Elena is the youngest. There are 520 refugee children living here in a facility designed to accommodate 200 adults. The Babayans were newsworthy even before the earthquake because there were so many of them. Now four children are gone and Yuri's grief seems heavier because they were his four sons. Can you put your family back together again? I don't know how I'll do it. It's not clear to me. We do not know whether the authorities will give us a house or if we'll have to build one ourselves. Nothing is clear. Rehousing the homeless and scattered survivors could take a long time. The Italian government has supplied 204 portable units for a temporary village near Spitak. They won't come close to meeting the needs. Construction of permanent housing won't even start until next year. The authorities plan to replace public buildings like schools and hospitals first. In a vegetable field a few kilometers outside Spitak, survey crews are laying out a new town site for more than 20,000 people. It will be called Spitak as well. The bill for reconstruction in Armenia will amount to more than 17 billion dollars. Soviet officials have set a two-year deadline. Workers on the ground complain that the haste is causing chaos. Spitak's chief architect, Ararat Ejan, is sympathetic. 
I do not think that we should be forced to work to the government's deadlines of two or three years for the rebuilding of Spitak. I don't really believe that such deadlines are realistic, and I don't think the people will mind if it takes longer. In remote villages like Nal Band, all but a handful of the people have fled the destruction. Those who stayed are still struggling to understand how a village 160 years old could be reduced to rubble in 30 seconds. How a community of 2,600 could be reduced to 800 overnight. How in a minute, 400 friends and neighbors could die so violently in the assumed sanctuary of their jobs or schools or homes. Albert Papoyan is chairman of the village Soviet. He lost 21 close relatives, including his young son. This kind of suffering does not leave the people's minds. Not for a minute, not for a day, not for a month. More time is needed so that the people can somehow learn to cope before we can get on with rebuilding the town. The shocked inertia after a great trauma postpones recovery but seems to make coping easier. 24 people live in this tent, clustered around the 85-year-old family matriarch who is a symbol of the clan's indestructibility. Miriam Galoyan, who lost 17 relatives, clings to such symbols at a time when even her deep religious faith is tested to its limits. When we are in trouble, we pray, Dear God, will you please save us? Please save us. We say that, but he does not save us. Miriam Galoyan's despair is misleading. It's part of a deep contradiction in the Armenian character. Pain fuels a determination to survive. Despair nourishes faith. The custodian of their faith is Catholicus Vaskin I, patriarch of the Armenian Orthodox Church. He says the people will soon put the earthquake behind them as they have even worse tragedies. I think all peoples would behave like this, but the difficult days will pass. Remember, our people were once in an even more terrible state than we are today. It was during the course of the First World War when we lost two million people in the genocide. Armenia's most famous shrine is an eternal flame commemorating the 1915 massacre in Turkey. On the last day of February this year, 800,000 people, almost a quarter of the population, joined a silent procession to the monument, which has become a universal symbol of Armenian grief. This demonstration of national grief has nothing specific to do with the earthquake. It's to remind the world that Armenian history is a long tapestry of tragedy. In a general way, the earthquake has already become part of that history, the most recent episode of national suffering, even perhaps a little easier to accept, for nobody inflicted the earthquake on the Armenians deliberately. They call it the genocide. In the chaotic breakup of the Ottoman Empire, Muslim Turks slaughtered as many as a million and a half Christian Armenians. Like the Jewish Holocaust, the genocide unites Armenians everywhere in remembrance of six centuries of repression by Turks and Russians, and six centuries of resistance. Noemi Nargitsian, a ballerina who lives in the United States now, is haunted by the images of 1915. Genocide. When I was a child, I, don't, I didn't know what that mean, but my parents took a hand and told me about this, and when I grew up, every year I was coming here and putting flowers for my grandmother, for my grandfather, for my people. February 1988, a new episode in the Armenian struggle unfolds in the neighboring Muslim Republic of Azerbaijan. Armenians want Moscow to give them control of an Armenian Christian part of Azerbaijan called Nagorno-Karabakh. Last year, Muslims in Azerbaijan lashed out at Armenians. Dozens died. In the inflamed history of the Armenians, this too is part of the genocide. The casualties in the fight over Nagorno-Karabakh are enrolled in the Armenian Order of Martyrs. They become part of a political army made up of the victims of all the Armenian struggles, an invincible army of ghosts. 
The Armenian cause is a political campaign for attention and support in a world that is usually indifferent to the struggles of small cultures. The political consequences of the earthquake have been muted so far. Raising political issues at a time of mourning is usually counterproductive, but the disaster does have a legitimate political dimension. Armenia is now forced to lick not one, but several serious wounds. Rafael Popoyan is a leading Armenian nationalist and outspoken political dissident. What I want to say is this, the earthquake and all of the damage caused by it must not be examined only from the perspective of a horrible natural disaster. Those wounds we suffered as a result of the earthquake were compounded by the wounds suffered at the hands of those who hold the power in our country. Soviet officials don't even try to rebut critics who say the tragedy was made much worse because the system is corrupt. Ararat Jan, chief architect for Spitak, admits what amounts to criminal negligence in construction methods at this school in his city. Badly mixed concrete crumbles at the touch. Structural steel beams and reinforcing rods were unwelded at critical joints. When the earth shuddered for a few seconds in December, the corrupted structures collapsed quickly. Schools like this one were death traps for 1,200 children and 80 teachers. We mistakenly undertook a plan of quantity. And when you undertake a plan of quantity, immediately you place quality in jeopardy. This is why the damage was so great. Abel Agenbegian, of Armenian background and one of Mikhail Gorbachev's closest advisors, thinks the tragedy underlines the need for reform. It's an incomparable tragedy, and now is the time of thinking over, of analysis. And we see that such a tragedy might not have occurred if we had properly measured the seismographic terrain, if we had built the way one must build in a seismic area, and so on and so on. We are drawing conclusions, as well as sympathizing, unpleasant, heavy conclusions that the degree of tragedy could have been avoided. High in the Caucasus Mountains in Soviet Armenia, people are stirring, putting their grief and despair behind them. They're building flimsy, primitive shelters from the wreckage of homes, which once seemed indestructible. As the protective numbness wears off, work diverts the mind from the pain of remembering the December day last year when their lives changed utterly. The earthquake is part of a tragic heritage, but there's a difference this time. Technology and a new enlightenment in the Soviet Union permit the world to watch the unfolding of this Armenian tragedy. And when it has passed, the world may well remember the Armenians not as the pathetic victims of history and their own political folklore, but as survivors. I hope the world will not forget Armenia from now on, but I know that Armenia will not let itself be forgotten. In spite of the destruction and all the tragic memories, Armenia is a land sustained by optimism. Optimism that the most recent tragedies will pass quickly into the collective memory, which seems to nourish a determination to survive. Armenians believe it's essential to that survival that the attention of the world captured so dramatically during the past few months will not lapse again into indifference. Armenians want the world to know them as they know themselves, a people haunted by history but eternally hopeful. For The Journal, I'm Lyndon McIntyre near Spitak, Armenia. That documentary was produced by Harry Phillips. We'll be back in a moment with The Diary. Tonight, a new safety feature that could be included with your next car, an airbag. Hope you like it. You'll have to pay for it and a story about Adam, Eve, and the Big Apple. Mm -hmm.